Hey guys, before we jump into the video, I have a massive update I need to update everybody on. So the other day, I told you guys how Neva's parents' church was in a lot of financial hot water and they needed $10,000 by October in order to keep the church. And well, I shared the GoFundMe that was on there and we didn't just raise the $10,000. We raised the entirety of their mortgage, $105,178 in two days. I shouldn't say we, that was all you guys. So we have Navis parents here. They just want to say their thank you. I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you, thank you very much to everyone. We are baffled to, to, to we are without words uh, on how God moves, Veronica. and. And we had a payment that was due on October 1st or October 14th, I believe. And thank you to you, all of you guys. We're going to be able to pay that church. Sí, realmente estamos muy contentos. Queremos darle las gracias a todos los que hicieron el esfuerzo para donar, para que nosotros podamos seguir adelante con nuestro ministerio. Como pastores creemos en los milagros. Y esto que el Señor hizo fue un grande milagro. De verdad, muchas gracias a todos. Muchas, muchas, muchas gracias. Dios los bendiga. Thank you, all the fans, and thanks Cole for uh, God, for the calling of God onto his heart. And from the bottom of our hearts, thank you to everyone, everyone that donated. God bless you guys. Muchas gracias a todos. All right, everybody, you are watching me, not Cole the Corn Star. I get to start the video off today. So I just thought I'd do the old how he does it when he comes out and kind of walk around, scratch my head, and like, where do I go? What do I do? But I know where I'm heading to. I'm actually heading to the bin site. Do -do -do -do. Where'd that hammer go? Uh, might be on the back truck. We're going to be working up, working on the overhang today. Looks like it's time to clean up. It's about, well, it's nine o'clock at night. Today is Cole's birthday. So happy birthday, Cole. All right, everybody, let's just call it a night and we'll talk to you tomorrow. How are we doing today, Coop? Good, yesterday when we were moving plywood on the telehandler, it fell and smashed my toes and broke our speed square. So this morning, I'm gonna be the run around guy for a little bit. I need to run down to the lumber yard. We need to pick up some extra wood and some tin and other materials for the dryer shack. And I'm sorry, you guys slid down a little bit. And then I'm gonna run by the DMV, see if I can pass the stinking test again. And while I'm there, I'm gonna talk about maybe widening one of the driveways to one of our farms, because I don't think we're gonna be able to get our semis in it. While we're doing that, Dad and Cooper are working on the dryer shack. The Ben guys are building the bed. I don't even know if I'm pointing in the right area. And Brian's crew is here working on the pads for the leg, and the welder guys are welding. A lot going on, but let's go get some stuff ordered. Okay, we got our list. We're here at the lumber yard. Let's go spend some money. Look at that, Cooper, new speed square. And Dad, I got your pencils. All right, stinking semi test third time's a charm we're gonna get it this time sable just showed up so she's gonna raise me and cooper up and down off of the uh tickler bone so we can get up and start scalping away on the building we got sable coming around the corner here doing an 80 miles per hour she's whipping in there she's bouncing around Told you guys, third time was a charm, I passed. But now I need to head over to the county engineer's office. We have three field driveways in some fields that need to be widened out. So I'm gonna go talk to them and see what we need to get done to get those fixed. Cause right now they're too narrow to be able to get our new combine in. I should clarify, the, the bean head is too big to be able to fit into them. And the 24 row planter. Trying to show you what I mean here. So this is Orland's farm and this is one of the driveways we can use. And the other one is down in that patch of weeds. Now that driveway is really steep. So when we come in with the 24 row planter, it would gouge into the ground if we use that driveway. So we can't use that one. And this one here, you have like literally six inches on both sides of it before you dip off into the ditch. And when you just have no margin for error, their accidents are just waiting to happen. So we're gonna try to double the width of a driveway over here. That way we can kinda maybe get into it a little bit easier. These guys are up here practicing their karate moves. 
You can always tell who's doing the hardest work around here. I wonder, could you jump from that one to over to there? You can try it. Yeah. It'll make good footing. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. ah, it's kind of fun to see if he can fly like a bird. Oh, hey, Brandon, what are you doing here? How's it going? Gonna go check some corn. You wanna get in? Uh, I, uh, I'll see you later. By the way, guys, I have a braid in. Sable did it for me. What do you think? <laughs> oh, no comment. Oh, okay. Oh, me? I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I'm a big fan of braids. We're coming up here on Kristen and Rusty's, and then on the other half of this is Bill's. There is four champion numbers in this field, but without my monitor here, I don't know exactly which one. So we're gonna head down the road a little bit further to Melvin's. Melvin's has 2889 yen. It's a good number. Is that your favorite number? I think so. I think it's the one I picked to win. Why is 2889 your favorite number? Because it's more than 2888. Brandon, you're supposed to object because we're the corn stars, not the bean stars. I know, but you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. Overall, how are beans looking across the state? So far, they're doing all right. Some more parts of the state that have a little bit more drought. We're definitely starting to see that impact the beans, especially on the lighter, sandier soil types. All in all, they're hanging in there. We look at the beans here today, you know, these pods are kind of flat as they mature and as they get a little bit more rain and some nutrients in them, they'll kind of fill out into a bigger, heavier bean, and that's where a lot of yield can be found. Got a bunch of pods on there, though. Yeah, these are potted pretty heavy. Dang, look at that stem. Look at the stock. <laughs> so this right here, Cole, that's what I always like to see, the four bean pod. Four leaf clover. Four leaf clover. A lot of your, most of your Wait, pod. What do, you, what do you mean by four bean pod then? A four bean pod, this pod has four beans growing in it. Most of your soybeans are going to be three beans per pod. And every now and then, one pod will get extra happy, a little extra nutrients in it, and we'll find, uh, find four and sometimes even five beans in a pod. Brandon. All of our soybeans are always fours. <laughs> always fours. <laughs> so one thing we look at with beans is um, kind of the bean type. And so here we see we're getting some branching and that's kind of help create that nice canopy and close the row spacing. As guys plant soybeans in more narrow rows, maybe more upright leaf or upright style. Uh, but for a 30 inch row setting, having that bushier style that kind of closes the rows, canopies, and then conserves moisture is definitely a benefit. And by 30 inch row, one of the rows is here, one of the rows is here, the gap between them is 30 inches. Some people plant 22 inch rows, 20 inch rows, 15 inch, seven and a half. Am I forgetting any? Nope, I think that covers it. And in corn, some guys go 60s, 36s, 30s, 22s, 20s, 15s. I've never heard anything smaller. No, I haven't either. Cole, I'm actually finding a lot of four bean pods here. I told you, they're so all fours. One there. We got one here so quite a bit of four bean pods that's definitely going to be a nice little yield bump the benefit or i guess why we look for some of these four bean pods not only indicates uh, good yield conditions good plant health and good growing conditions but if you think about it one four bean pod per plant would be one extra bean per plant times 140,000 beans which is how many plants we planted per acre so you would have 140,000 extra beans per acre which is roughly an extra bushel advantage over all three bean pods. Because fun fact, there's 140,000 soybeans in a bushel of soybeans. Looking at bug control here though, I, I did see a beetle right there. Why do they always wrestle like that? <laughs> I haven't figured that out. I think when a, when a mommy Japanese beetle loves a daddy Japanese beetle. They wrestle? <laughs> they wrestle. <laughs> but overall, I mean, looking at plants here, I'm not seeing a lot of damage. You can see where they were maybe a little snacky right there. Yep. What was that children's book called, The Hungry Caterpillar? I think so, yeah. Yeah, he was here. Yep. And this field was sprayed twice with herbicide because the first time we sprayed it wasn't effective and came back again. It seemed like it did a really nice job here. But what do we got going here, Brandon? These are a little discolored. Yeah, so this looks like uh, what we call sudden death syndrome in soybeans. SDS? SDS. And so uh, what that is, it's a, it's a fungal pathogen found in the soil. We have wet, saturated soils after planting. That fungal pathogen will move through the moisture in the soil, get on that seedling, and infect the roots. Then, about this time of year, if we get a rain, it'll rain, and as the plant takes that up, it actually moves the toxin from the roots up into the canopy, and that's where we see the leaf symptomology. So, so there's really nothing I can do about this now? This is going to die? This plant will die. You know, sometimes we'll get a big pocket of it. This is pretty sporadic, so I don't think we're going to see a big yield reduction, especially coming in this late in the game. A few years back, we had sudden death syndrome move in in late July and had some really big yield impacts. We're getting further along in grain fill, so the yield impact will be a little bit less. There are some seed treatments 
out there that we could apply to the seed to prevent this. Um, but at this stage of the game, there isn't really much that could be done. But even if you have a seed treatment, like it's kind of inevitable, like you're probably going to have it in some way, shape or form. And, you know, whether it's a, a couple plants here or there mm -hmm. pockets, like. Yeah. Even with the seed treatment, um, there's different varieties have different tolerances to SDS. So variety selection is going to be your best bet. Coupling that with a seed treatment that controls sudden death and even with those two things combined, it's still not gonna be 100%. You still might have some, uh, but you're definitely gonna have a lot less instances of sudden death and a lot less yield loss by using those two methods to control it. You guys didn't know you were coming to science class today, did you? Holy cow, it's like WWE on this one. <laughs> I got a question for you. When I was little, it seemed like all the soybeans had a, a round leaf on them and they were a lot bigger, but nowadays mm -hmm. it seems like we have a pointy soybean leaf and they're a lot skinnier, is that just, a different variety or these enlist ones seem to do it more than what i remember from our liberty stuff or is it just like the new thing yeah there can definitely be a genetic component similar to kind of the branching and the bushiness some of the leaf styles will be a little different uh if we look here a little lower in the canopy we get to some bigger wider oh, leaves there's there's the old-fashioned yeah. ones we'll get some bigger wider leaves as we get fuller in the canopy the plant changes from putting on a lot of leaves and vegetation and more towards grain fill and putting more weight towards okay. the beans in the pods. So what's up with these yellow guys? That's kind of a natural thing. Um, they're pretty clean. I'm not seeing anything that would indicate disease. I think they're just lower in the canopy so they're not getting as much sunlight. So they are kind of starting to, to senesce or kind of fall off because they're not really contributing photosynthesis to the plant. So I cracked open a pod. This is what the beans look like at this stage. You wanna try one? They taste like lima beans? They taste like edamame. What would you like? Edamame, green soybeans. <laughs> but obviously they're full of moisture. They're gonna to continue to put on some size and some weight. And then- They're really soft right now. Really like soft. You can just squeeze right into them. I didn't cut my thumbnail for this purpose so I could squeeze into this today. You're wishing you didn't eat that edamame, did you? It's got a little funky aftertaste. <laughs> oh, Brandon, this one has two on it. What, what's going on? Well, give it time, it'll still grow. <sighs> It's like funny. Pretty dang impressed with these beans. Yield prediction. 59 bushels. I oh, gotta do better than that. <laughs> 65 bushels. 69 bushels. 69 bushels. There we go. <laughs> oh, okay. So this next field we're going to here, this is what we call the Hanson Farm. At the main hitted shop right over there, the field around Dad's there, there's a creek that runs through it. Hanson Farm's on this side. Then we got west of Dad's right over there on that hillside. So this is 56A21. Now we'll check the ears right on the edge of the field, sitting all by themselves, and we'll find the biggest one. And that'll be an accurate representation of the whole field, right? <laughs> I think that's how it works. This overachiever is putting on two ears. No, three? Three. We got three ears on this one. I hope you have a good tax guy because you're about <laughs> to have a problem. Yeah. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about raising corn is most people think there is multiple ears per plant. On the edge here where there's plenty of real estate for air to come in, a lot of photosynthesis going on, a lot of nutrients available, you can have plants that have several on them. Like this guy's here got two. But in general, out in the field, we only have one. Yeah, that's already half milk line. 40% moisture in the kernels right now. When it black layers or reaches maturity, it'll be about 30%. And then harvest will start anywhere around 20 20 percent moisture maybe a little higher than that so by 40 percent moisture you mean that 40 percent of the weight within this kernel is moisture is moisture is water so this time of year what we're looking for is overall plant health just looking at the leaves seeing if we're seeing any disease, insect feeding, that kind of thing. So by disease, you mean like discoloring, if you see any yellow spots, gray spots? Yep. Is that a little disease right there? Yeah, so that would be some gray leaf spot. Um, it's another fungal pathogen that is infecting the leaf and basically- Why do they call that gray leaf spot? So right it's now- it's a gray it's, spot. <laughs> yes, pretty much. So right now it's kind of red, but once that tissue dies, it'll turn very gray. But with the fungicide application like this field got, we're really not seeing anything for disease or insects seeing some really nice looking ears. So what we just saw there, that's within tolerance of not really affecting yield? Correct, yep. Is this a big ear or a small ear? That's pretty typical for this hybrid. Uh, this hybrid, we kind of see longer, skinnier ears. We don't get a lot of fat, fat girthy ears with 18, 20 kernels around. Wait, so when a hybrid is being made, they know like the characteristic of the ear that's already gonna be on it, kind of? Yeah, to, for the most part, growing conditions, the environment's gonna have a lot of impact on it. Uh, but different hybrids will have different ear styles. Hmm. Um, kind of like the soybeans with their leaf type and that. Ears can be short and fat, and we'll see 18, 20 kernels around and not very many long. 
a hybrid like this will maybe see 14 to 16 kernels around and then a lot longer in length. The other thing we look for is uh, how well we pollinated. This hybrid or this plant, this ear pollinated very closely to the tip. Under some stress conditions, we can then see some of the tip that pollinated, it'll abort those kernels if it doesn't think it can support them all. And we're not seeing that here, so. Because a little bit of tip back is good. It shows you're at the right uh, population, Population, right? correct. So yep. you think we can maybe up it based off this year? Based off that year, I would say, you know, maybe another thousand or 1500 plants per acre would maybe be a little bit more of an optimum. Uh, we're we're kind of maximizing this year, but all in all, you know, seeing just that very little tip is a good sign. Found a competitor year. How'd that get in here? Dang. <laughs> seed <laughs> well, there's even a little baby ear in there oh oh this is what they have at those mongolian restaurants right. <laughs> the formula we do to do kind of a yield estimate is we'll count kernels around multiply by kernels long multiplied by plants per acre and then we'll take that number and divide it uh, by the amount of kernels in a bushel and that'll give us an estimate for what this part of the field could end up yielding if all these kernels uh, fully develop gives us a little bit of a baseline but there's, that's for just this part of the field. You know, if we're in a good part or a, a worse part, field average is definitely gonna fluctuate across the whole the whole area. Cause this one's got a little tip back on it. Yeah, well, that's the second year. Oh, that's the second year? That's the second year. Oh. <laughs> and that's, I mean, for 34,000, that's pretty even spacing. We got 14 by 38. Have you ever seen an odd number? No, you will always have an even number on corn. What if you find an odd number? Could I sell it on eBay for $10,000? I think you might have a pretty nice scientific find there. I would turn it in for some money. So we'll do 14 times 38, and then we'll multiply that by, the planting rate was 34,500 plants per acre. Not 100% of those will emerge. So conservatively, we'll say there's 31 harvestable ears here. So we'll multiply it by 31,000 plants per acre. Then we'll divide by 90, which is 90,000 kernels per bushel. That gives us a yield estimate of 183. And I'd say too, for the year we've had, we're definitely low on moisture. We've had a lot of high heat days. Uh, a which lot really, of high heat days. Anything over 90 degrees is really gonna stress the corn. So the last month has been 90 degrees every day yep, with no rain. No rain, high heat, high humidity, and that's really gonna stress the plant. And so for this part of, of Iowa and the area, I don't think we're gonna see record yields by any means. I think we're gonna be a lot closer to average. So a lot of the yield estimates we've been doing have been in that. 175 to 210 range. And guys, keep in mind, this is just a sample of the field. Cause I mean, even just walking down a few plants later, oh, that one's got two on it too. But there is a lot of ear size variety. Well, that one's got two on it as well. I'm looking at this little guy and not yeah. realizing there's a monster above it. Holy smokes. Okay, never mind. This field is gonna do 280. This is 243. So five the, hey, hey, this oh, one is the, also on there. Plus the bonus ear. As I say, most plants only have one, but I've actually done several with two. So 24 by 16. So this is 128 bushel corn right here. So 128 plus a 242, plus a 242 on one plant. On one plant. What the heck? See, that guy's got two. He's got a little one started. That guy's got two. That guy's got two. Wait till I see what I got for you, Cole. Very own Corn Star Farms Champion Seed Sign. Guys, if you buy $3 million worth of seed from Champion, you get a sign. You too can have a sign like this. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that. I should prove that with you first. What's that? I should have approved that with you oh, first. Oh yeah, no, three million and, and we can get you a sign. Precious cargo coming through. Over here at Zach's, this is the field right across from his house. There's 35 acres on this side. Champion 6820. All right, you take your pick, which way? Where are the big ears at? This way. So one thing I'm noticing here is we should be seeing some brown silks. The silks are what- uh, Oh, like what sticks out at the end of the ear like that? Yeah. So these brown silks, these are the silks that come out of the ear and the pollen falls on them and pollinates the kernels. On some of this corn that's leaned a little bit, I'm seeing we're missing the silks, which tells me something's been feeding on them. And most likely this year, we've been seeing corn rootworm beetles very thick, even on some rotated acres. And so most likely what happened was some corn rootworm larvae uh, chewed on the roots. And then during a wind event, uh, the corn kind of goosenecked. Then after the larvae emerge out of the ground, we have all the beetles flying around and they're gonna feed on these silks here. So when we were talking about different hybrids can put on different ears, unlike 56A21, a long skinny ear, 60A20 is gonna be a big fat ear. So we'll see a lot of 20 year rounds with this hybrid. So those rootworm beetles were eating the end here? 
they were eating the silks and the last silks to emerge are the ones that pollinate the tip so if they ate those they would brown silk last so they probably were feeding on those which then made it impossible for the tip of the oh. ear to pollinate yeah because each silk here goes to an individual kernel so if we would have eliminated the ones that go to the kernels they're not going to be able to be pollinated they wouldn't have been able to be pollinated correct 33 so we're 18 by 33 here with a little bit of uh some pollination issues. We probably lost a good 10 kernels or better at least. Correct, yep. So we were getting 14 by 38 on 56A21. We're getting 18 by 33 on this year. So we'll do some quick math and see how that compares. So this is still a 204 bushel ear, despite having some of the issues with the corn rootworm feeding and then the, the silk clipping. And so if that took 10 kernels off all the way around, that would be a 43 by 18. What would that come out to? 62 bushel hit. So this part of the ear, had it fully pollinated, would have been 62 extra bushels. So we would have been basically looking at like a... 267. 260, yeah. This ear here had, was not silk clipped, had its brown silks still hanging out of the ear, and we see that we pollinated a lot more closely to the tip. This tip back I would consider to be very normal, especially at... Here, the, there's a little reference for yeah, you. Yeah, there you go, side by side. You can see... That one's been attacked by rootworm beetles, and this one really wasn't. This one has not. So 38, so we got five more kernel rows than this one. We probably still had five there at the tip. This tip back's more normal and shows kind of that optimum planting population. This one shows us we had an issue there uh, at pollination time. So even, that could still be 30 bushels more. Mm -hmm. So that's how you literally cannot tell the difference by looking, that's why yeah. it makes it tough on some hand-picked calculations. Yep, the other thing we look at too, so this year here, it's a uniform kernel row all the way down to the butt. Sure, sure. This one here, we see a little bit of mix match. So maybe we were gonna start to be about 20 kernels around and about B12 when the plant is determining kernels around. If there was some stress at that time, lack of rain, high heat, it said, nope, we can't support 20 kernels around, shrunk down to 18 and then we get straight. So, so Okay, that makes a sense. So a little bit of not perfectly straight kernel rows here can kind of indicate some stress at that time frame as well. I don't know about you, but I'm not gonna complain at 204 at $5 corn even. And yeah, with 10 inches of rain since planting, that's yeah. not too bad. Yeah. So we'll notice here, looking at the kernels, we kind of see a little bit of a deeper dent than we did in the last field. 60A20 has some good test weight, but probably not as high as 56A21. And that's a little bit evident just by looking at the dent and then uh, kind of the texture, we call that a rough cap where it kind of gets wrinkly. That's an indic indica oh. indicative. Indicative? Indicative. Do you know how to spell that? Not, not at the current <laughs> moment. Of, of the test weight. So your real high test weights will have just a real minimal dent and a real uh, full thick cap. More average test weight will have a little bit of a rougher wrinkle in the, the huh. cap of the kernel. I did not know that. Test weight refers to how much a bushel of corn weighs. So on average it's 56 pounds. Correct. So if you have 62 pound test weight, which how they determine that, I'm not sure. But basically that's a, a yield percentage boost from 56 pounds to 62. Essentially it's the density of the kernel. You have more weight packed into a kernel, so it's gonna be less kernels per bushel. So when we divide by 90, you could divide by, in our yield calculation formula, you could divide by 100, indicating you're gonna have a light, a test, light weight. test weight, more kernels per bushel. Uh, you could divide by 80, indicating high test weight, less kernels per bushel. Huh, pull a USDA there, huh? <laughs> a little bit of nitrogen deficiency here. Oh. And in a year like this, so this this V yellow V shape going down the mid rib um, is indicative of nitrogen deficiency. In a year like this, and kind of knowing the Corn Star Farms fertility program, it's less likely that there's not enough nitrogen in the soil. We just didn't have enough rain to move that nitrogen up in the plant. Corn plants drink their food, as the moisture in the soil um, moves the water soluble nutrients, the roots take those up, bring them into the plant. Without moisture, we're just not getting the nutrient uptake we normally do. We put uh, 34 and a half gallons per acre on side dressing and we also put that on up front. So 245. 245. And it takes a pound of nitrogen to produce one bushel of corn. So theoretically 245 bushels an acre based off how much nitrogen we put on, not including What's already in the soil. Yeah. We're definitely dry here, but we are not as dry as like Zach Johnson in Minnesota or Chet Larson in Minnesota. They're they're burning up up there. They're significantly drier than we are. Always remember if you're lost in the woods, the bark always grows on the outside of the tree. Hey Brandon, last field. This is the North Farm. This is the champion of the champion seeds that we've planted for the past couple years. 58A21. As you can see, we got a really nice stand out here. 
Yep. Little sprayer blight, but nothing yep. bad. <laughs> the Heggy donuts are back at it. Two. Three. Three? Third little nubbin. No, nah, that's Mongolian corn down there. Little further behind in maturity, not quite as dented as the last field we were in. 39 by 18. That's going to be a high yielder. Any predictions? 39 by 18. We're probably looking at a 248. 248? Oh, that was closer. You got it. Price is right, baby. Price is right, yep. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> so earlier we talked about pollinating to the tip. So these pink kernels that are the color or color of the cob basically never pollinated. Here we see these really little yellow shriveled ones. Those kernels pollinated and then due to some stress, some heat, some lack of rain, corn plant did not think it could support all those kernels and then aborted some of those at the end. That's not very much. Um, you know, we're probably only one kernel row high. So that's not going to affect it too drastically, but that still is one thing. Affects we, it. it still affects it. And that's one thing we look at this time of year is, was the plant happy and healthy all the way through? Didn't abort any kernels or did we have some stress that we aborted kernels back? I, I, I got to admit, you look a lot more sophisticated with the <laughs> with ice the gold your neck. Yeah. <laughs> 16? What? That looks that just means way deep. bigger means... around than 16. This is what I mean how deceptive it is, guys. This one is 18 around and 39 long, okay? And this one here is 16 around and 40 long. <laughs> you, you would think this thing's 22 around. Hey guys! We went to three different fields. What were you doing to the neighbors? <laughs> you shouldn't really be going through the neighbor's field. Hanson's is like that? Yeah, south of the creek there. Oh, same field. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, what was also weird is this was attached to the same plant. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's the second year. Like every other plant had two on it there. It was just like that. This is the main one, that's the second. And then that's the main one, that's the second. Holy cow! <laughs> this is a 242 here by itself, and this is 120. Really? Yeah. All right guys, say goodbye to Brandon. Hi, I'm glad he left. If anyone's interested in Champion Seed, I'll include the link to their website down below. If you kinda wanna check out what they got, give someone a phone call if you're interested in checking out some seed. Be my guest. We got a sable over here making a little runway or a little ramp into our building to make it easier to get in and out. How do you like it? Uh, it's different. Different? Yeah. Better or worse? I like it, but I keep trying to like tip the bucket with this hand. But this is the only yeah, control. the controls are different. Do you want it set the other way? Dad and Cooper have been busy all day getting the rest of this thing sheeted. We got insulation guys coming at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. They're finishing up the last little bits right between the rafters. They have to cut some boards to fit in there. So that way we have a nice tight seal with the foam. And Sable's out here making a little ramp with the JCB. I'm going to hop in the Bobcat here and help her. I guess we have to make a ramp up here so that way the insulation guys can get their lift thingamajig or whatever it's called inside the building. Today was a little sciencey, but guys, I had a lot of fun today going out there in the field and looking at the plants and trying to figure out, okay, maybe the plant was deficient in this, or we had this issue because we were able to take all that data that we collected today, and then we can pass that down into next year for our operation. So let's say the rootworm beetle example, maybe next year we're gonna, maybe we'll have to look into that a little more, spray a little bit more insecticide to take care of those things because I mean, right there we saw a 30 bushel drop. I don't know if this affected all of our acres or not because when you're in a small sample area, you could have just been in an infected pocket. But let's say hypothetically, it affected the entire thousand acres of corn that we had. At 30 bushels an acre, that'd be 30,000 bushels of corn, so at five bucks, that'd be $150,000 that those bugs would have cost in damages where the insecticide we put on is like $2 an acre. So for $2,000 worth of prevention, we could have saved 148,000. That's just an example of some kind of data that we can collect and we can carry into next year's. And also just going out there and being like, okay, the plant had stresses during this time of the year. And you kind of have a better idea of what's going on with the plant, maybe why you got the yield that you did. And you can also look at it as a point of improvement of, hey, could we do anything better than what we did this year? And 
I mean, I noticed a couple things out there. So it's just kind of exciting. And honestly, the yields were a lot better than I anticipated, at least in the areas that we were in. For as dry as we've been, the corn looks phenomenal and so does the beans. So I'm really getting excited for harvesting. Guys, we could be harvesting within the next four weeks. It's the 24th of August right now. So let's see. We could, we could be coming on the 24th of September easily. That's crazy to think about. Once the first of September starts rolling around here, we'll start pulling all the equipment out. We really don't have a lot that we need to fix on stuff. Just mainly kind of greasing everything up, double checking everything over, maybe changing some fluids and things. But other than that, the equipment should basically be ready. And speaking of ready, I think I'm ready to end this video because I don't have anything else to talk about and I don't have anything else to show you. So thanks for watching guys. We'll see you in the next one. <laughs>